Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're speaking today with artist Frank Bramblett. Frank is an abstract painter and Pew Fellow whose work is included in the exhibit Elemental, Nature is Language at the Woodmere Art Museum. Frank taught at Tyler School of Art, and when he retired in 2010, his former students organized an exhibition called Thanks, Frank. We co-taught a senior painting studio with Frank. We think we learned more that semester than the students did, and they were great students. Uh, you were born in a small town in Alabama and wound up going to Yale School of Art. Tell us about that journey. It was, it's quite a distance. I, uh, I, heard a, I heard an interview on NPR on the way over here this morning with, I, and I don't know who it was with, it was either the writer or the director uh, of, of a current film, Being Flynn. He was talking about, he was asked what the story was about, and he said, the story is about how where you come from can become who you are. You know, where you come from is, is a big open thing. It could be your genealogy, it could be your uh, experiences, it could be your parents, it could be the people that you're associated with around you, it could be the kind of community that you are in, city, country, whatever. But I think it's also how you negotiate as you emerge as, a, as an individual. And, and I, I very much relate to that because I've, I feel a, a very strong affinity to my roots in rural Alabama, a very small town. And yet I, I would never uh, think about moving back there. And I wouldn't use the word escape, but I, I, I might say that I, I found other things that somehow offered me a buffer relative to what that experience of, you know, milking cows and slaughtering hogs and all of those kinds of things that I did as a child. Um, we lived in a town, but the family had a, what was once a plantation. And so uh, I spent a lot of time on that property. And, you know, eventually one thing led to another. One door opened and I closed another and just kept moving forward. But I've, I've never forgotten, you know, playing in the mud uh, in Alabama. There's some paintings downstairs done with Alabama mud of hers, of uh, uh, Elaine Kratz. And Kurtz. All, Kurtz, I'm sorry, thank you. I didn't tell anybody, but the one painting down there that shares X as a title has actually some Alabama mud in it. You know, I, it's something that I did. I played in that mud. I built houses in that mud. I pretended as, you know, I ventured in my, in my mind that playfulness that I had. I was also an only child. I didn't have very many people of my age that immediately lived near me. And so, um, you know, I look at that as, as contributing significantly to giving me the permission to go into a studio alone and work as a practicing painter uh, without having the need for any kind of thing or any kind of people or any kind of input from those that might be around me. So were you making things that were like paintings when you were a child, or when did you decide that you were an artist? I knew I was an artist. I made things constantly. I was seen as like the prodigy in the little town of Widawi. I had a teacher in the second and fourth grade who was Mrs. Strain, May Strain. She was very supportive. Uh, she was one of the old maids in the town, and she lived with her sister. She traveled the world in her summers. You know, she went to Egypt and she went to Europe and she would come back and she would show me her scrapbooks of things that she had collected, postcards, things like that. She knew that I had that kind of ability. I never really saw myself pursuing it, and I, I've told people this many times before because as having that kind of ability, I was often asked to constantly make paintings for other people. And I didn't like it, because I like to do something different each time. And each time I repeated myself, I felt as if something was missing. And it wasn't until I was like well into my college career, my, my last year actually, that I decided to take an art course. And I stumbled across an incredible course that was not about you know, skill, it was more about just learning how to see. 
Uh, it was but just, it was a studio class? It was called Art in the Dark. Everything was done in the dark. The teacher had no role in it other than the flashing slides uh, for very short periods of time. And, and I fell in love with it again. I had another teacher in that same semester. It was an event. That was a foundations class. And then I had a, a, an advanced class where the teacher essentially dumped a bunch of things in the middle of the studio, said we had to do a painting on acrylic that was four by six feet or larger, and that he'd be back in a month to grade our paintings, and that we were to put our paintings up against the wall, in a, and, and he would um, do the grading. Well, I came, you know, a month later he came back, and there was my painting against the wall, and it had a, a letter on it, and that was the way the work was reviewed. <laughs> Had you worked in acrylic before? Had no. you been working at paint, as a painter? No, in fact, that, that was a seminal moment uh, because, I, and, I, and I look at it as even relating to this, this exhibition, I'd always worked in oil and, you know, pastel and, and uh, crepas, things like that. And I didn't know what acrylic was, and I guess I felt like when I went to the Lumberyard, which is the place in the town where they sold artist paints for the university students, large tubes of paint, which were like $3 as opposed to small tubes of the paint that I'd been accustomed to using that were $6. And uh, so it was a great thing. It wasn't until I got into my studio and started working with them, I realized that I destroyed my brushes, uh, didn't mix with turpentine. It, it didn't take me long then to start adapting what I was doing to what the possibilities of the incompatibility of the two paints were. The energy that came out of that, that kind of unexpected and unknown material with something that was very known and how they were both, in a sense, the same thing. They looked the same, but they didn't act the same, made me act differently than I'd ever acted before. And in that sense, it opened up a territory of exploration and of things looking different than what I, what I might have wanted them to look like. It became a challenge. How do you then create work that has a look that you don't know what that work is supposed to look like? That started to separate me from the idea of making really competent paintings, which I was capable of doing in a representational way, to becoming an artist, I guess. You know, like a, some, an artist who is seeking something that they don't know what that thing might be. And um, if you're alert enough, which... If I'm ever talking to anybody about their work and I, I say your work is really alert, it's probably the best criticism or the best compliment that I could give them. You know, that's the only way you grow is not when you see what you expect, but when you find something that can lead you forward, accepting the fact that there's a relevance to something that you were alert to, to realize. Materials was a breakthrough moment for you, going from oils to acrylic seemed to introduce you to the idea of creating art versus creating pictures, if I understood what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So then you explored further with materials like sand and charcoal and resins, and how did that happen? Did you just go full-blown into materials exploration? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's always been a part of um, how I expand my vocabulary of what something can look like. There's a kind of contradiction in the way that I look at things. I, I, in one sense, I feel like that I want every painting that I do to be unique and different and separate from anything else that I've ever done. But at the same time, I think that there is something coherently individual that must also be there that's sustained through anything and everything that you do. Working my way through the relationships that I have with materials and, and, and trying to follow their nose rather than my own, I end up realizing where my nose is. You know, I, it, it kind of comes back to me and then I become the, the thing that somehow is informed by those things in a way that I realize who I am. And I think that's what we see when we go to a museum. When we, when we stand before a uh, Velasquez or a Goya or I just had a conversation yesterday with someone about the Van Gogh show. Great at the Philly Museum of Art. At the Art. Philly, Philly Museum. Great opportunity to see many paintings I'd never seen before. Um, but I think that like all artists, sometimes he hits that mark of himself and many times he misses. 
For example, many people, including one of the people I was with, felt as if the last painting in the exhibition was the most exquisite, most beautiful painting in the entire show. The budding plant, I think it's a um, peach blossom, it's the most atypical Van Gogh you could possibly have. It has nothing to do with what makes Van Gogh a great painter, but is an extraordinarily beautiful painting. Let's talk about psychology for a minute. I don't have a degree in that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, but you are very astute at psychology, and it was our observation when we taught with you, co-taught the class in senior painting, that during a crit session where all the students would bring their work in, that you had very deep psychological insights into what was going on in the paintings. I guess we're just curious about how you get to the heart of things so with laser-like certainty and so quick? Well, when I was a kid, uh, and I think about this a lot, and I'm not saying it facetiously, I had a friend, his name was Graham, and uh, Graham talked to me all the time. He was with me all the time. He was my friend. Somehow I feel Is like... Is he a real friend, a human being, as opposed to, or an imaginary friend? I, what is the difference? <laughs> uh, Graham, I feel like, is always kind of telling me things to say. Because I never, when I say things like those things that you are talking about, I, I mean, I know where they came from in the sense of it, it's a cumulative kind of evolution of absorption of things that you see and things that you do and things that you've heard and things that you've read. I, I couldn't put my finger on specifically, you know, where it comes from, though, other than the fact that when I say it, I don't, I don't think about what I'm saying. I don't, I, I hear myself talking and I could never really repeat what I did just said. I kind of sometimes, if someone said, well, what did you just say? I say, okay, Graham, what did you just tell me? <laughs> you know, uh, I've never really talked to anybody about this before either. I, I know that my wife knows that I have this, this imaginary friend, Graham, but um, I, 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 I attribute it to him. You know, he's, he's, he's there. He's very smart, I have to say. Well, it's because he doesn't have to live in this world, maybe. What are you reading these days? Anything um, interesting? Yeah, I'm reading, um, I love Errol Morris. Oh, he's and um, he has a new book, relatively new book. It's been out a few months about photography, and it's amazing. And um, it really is interesting relative to the idea of photography as being truth. Uh, and, he, and the first essay is an essay, a long essay, comparing these two 1855 war photos that are the first photos of war done by a, a photographer named Fenton. And um, they're essentially the same thing, they're, except for one thing. And that is that it's just a camera on a tripod. And he took a shot of these fields and a road, a dirt road, going down through a valley. And it's totally littered with cannonballs. Mm-hmm. But there's a second photograph, and the one that you... And I can't even remember now because he goes back and forth and back and forth in his research about these images. But there's one that you see 99% of the time, and the other one was done at the same time or within hours, if not minutes, which is part of what his detective story is about, of trying to f- uh, figure out which was first or which one. Because the other one, the road is clear of cannonballs. And it's, it, it, it's a really interesting essay. It's the you know, only one I've read. I think there are about six in the book about how truth does not exist even in the very earliest forms of photography and, and the misnomer of like you know what a, a fixed image is. So do you think of the paintings that you're making now as being truth for you? I, I you know... Truth is what you make of it, I guess. Thank you for talking to us, Frank. We've been talking with Frank Gramblett at the Woodmere Art Museum. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. 
Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.